All right, this is really crazy. We got this winter weather warning earlier today, and it said that we could get up to two feet of snow and that driving in it would be impossible. So, of course, I was trying to run around and do a few things while I could, and all I thought we were supposed to get was some rain. So, earlier when I was out, I looked towards the east and these dark clouds started forming tornadoes and went into the store, came out, and I looked up and the clouds had moved east. That's when the man told me that a tornado did form just in the eastern county, just east of here, where those clouds went. So I made that quick video showing you the clouds. Fortunately, I'm... Uh, back inside. I stayed out there kind of filming some of the clouds and everything. Um, and I was able to clean this window which is amazing. Um, this is a hotel window so I don't think they've cleaned it at all and now I can see through it without it being like there was some sort of mist on it. And you can clearly look out. It made such a difference. So Hopefully you get a crystal clear view <laughs> behind me here of the bushes that are getting their new leaves up there. <laughs> I love that. So you're going to be literally blown away when I tell you what I have to tell you for today. The Lord had shown me quite some time ago about that they used to call the moon sin. And I knew that that was connected to the man of sin, which I said he would probably be a Muslim or Islamic because he worships the crescent moon god. And then just the other day in my video when I was talking about King Charles III having the little slivers from the cross and that that cross represented Jesus taking our sins away of humanity that that those pieces of wood do represent sin so I was thinking of another angle that the man of sin would be the one who has these shards of the true cross supposedly that's going to be in his coronation ceremony leading the way in the procession but this developed just all of a sudden and you're not going to believe what it links to. This is incredible and you're going to just have your mind blown once again because the Lord is obviously unveiling things of the last days before they happen and warning everyone. He sends a warning. He, he lets his people know ahead of time what's coming. And that's why I think, you know, that it's going to be the rest of the world that's going to be blindsided to the fact of uh, the identity of an antichrist. You know, they're not going to know. They're not going to know all of these details because the Holy Spirit is warning his people and we're getting prepared and ready to go meet the Lord in the glory cloud as soon as he comes and appears. So I gathered some of my research and I'm going to tell you everything about this that's just going to be mind-blowing about the man of sin and about um, sin being the crescent moon god, how that goes back to very, very ancient times. There's also some emblems that this fake deity was known for and known by certain names and depicted as certain characters. And that's going to be key to blowing this case wide open. You're not going to believe it. Hold on to your seat because this is unreal. If you know the scriptures and you know um, the Antichrist is coming, you know what I've been talking about, King Charles III, and showing all these things, the Lord's been just unveiling left and right. So, here we go. All right, so I'm going to read you something. That there is 
a sacred hill of the moon god Sin, known as Sogmatar. Sogmatar Sanherfa is 53 kilometers from Haran. It is located in Yagmurlo village. First I want you to hear a couple of scriptures and that's Psalm 106 verse 19 it says they made a calf in Horeb and worshiped the molded image thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass they forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt wondrous works in the land of Ham awesome things by the Red Sea Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he destroy them. And of course, we know in Exodus everything that happened with them building the golden calf. They overlaid the calf with the gold that they melted down from all their jewelry and the gold they took out of Egypt. And... By the way, the Egyptians did come and get the gold back at a certain point in time with Shishak, the pharaoh. So first I want you to hear this history in Genesis 11. And it gives all this genealogical line, who had sons and daughters and all this. And we get to Genesis 11:31, and it says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah and Abram were in Ur of the Chaldees, and they were in Haran, and that's where Abram's father died. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not just the Jews. Everyone. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So remember that name place. And then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And so they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, and as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. Now it goes on with the history of what happened there. And just before that happened, you had the story of the people being in Shinar. They journeyed from the east and that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. 
So then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. And this is what they will begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore the name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And then it gives the genealogy of Shem. So we come down to seeing the genealogy of Abram, who became Abraham. So what was going on there? So of course these people were creating the Tower of Babel, or Babel, and you had all this genealogical line coming down to Abraham and his father, Terah. So they were in Haran, idol worship going on in Haran and Ur. And this is why God took Abram out of Haran and told him to go to the land of Canaan. And we know that this is the land that became the land of Israel, the land that God promised to the children of Israel. So now I'm going to make all these connections for you here. The sacred hill of the moon god Sin, Sogmatar. Sogmatar, Sanherfa, is 53 kilometers from Haran. That's where Abram was and Terah, his father located in Yagmurlu village where there are important springs in the Tektek mountains. The Tektek mountains which have important Neolithic centers such as Kerahantepe, Harbet Suvan, and Kirk Tepesi also have a cult center belonging to the moon god Sin. The region is a cult center dedicated to the moon god Sin in the Tektek Mountains region of the Haranians during the Abgar Kingdom period. In the Sogmatar cult center, there is a cave where the moon god Sin is worshipped, Pognon Cave, and a hill, sacred hill, Turkish Kutsal Tepe, on the slopes of which there are reliefs of the god and inscriptions engraved on the ground. Also there are six square and round planned mausoleums, the inner castle and many rock tombs carved into the main castle. Although the ancient city of Sogmatar is dated to the 2nd century AD, researchers show that the history of the city dates back to 2000 BC. Sogmatar was founded by the people who fled from the region due to the intense attacks of the Parthians, Iranians, in the Urfa region, especially in 165 AD, and preserved its cult center feature until the Islamic period. Although the name of the moon god in Mesopotamian civilizations varies from culture to culture, it is mostly seen as sin and Nana. The Sumerians called their moon gods Nana, Nanar, or Suen. So, made me wonder if the name Banana, which sometimes you say, give me a Nana, <laughs> and it's shaped like a crescent moon, okay? I'm just thinking where this name might have come from. Sometimes they used to combine two different names in later periods the Akkadians of Semitic origin named the moon god Sin. Besides these names, Asimbabar, Nemrasit, and Inbu were among the words used to characterize Nana-Sin. The Sumerians used descriptions for Nana-Sin, each as the brightness of the moonlight the bull and Enlil's young bull and depicted him as a bull and a lion dragon. 
In addition, the symbol of this god consists of a crescent. The moon god Sin was very important to the Sumerian city of Ur. That's where Abraham came from. But in the following periods, the city of Haran, where they were dwelling, became an important center for Nana Sin. A triple god system was established in Haran with Nana Sin, Utu, and Inanna. Nana Sin who was accepted as the patron god of the city of Ur, is mentioned in the Sumerian pantheon as the son of Enlil. In the Sumerian text, it describes that Nanasin judged the dead in the underworld. It is said that he is the god who determines the time. One of the most important features attributed to Nanasin is that he acted with great vengeance in the face of the wrong deeds of the kings living on the earth and was an important power in punishing them. Although the moon is called Sin with its crescent shape, Nana at the full moon is gradually, it took the form of a Simba bar and its growing state. The moon god Sin is known as the most important god of all Semitic tribes. When it is in the form of a crescent, it is masculine. When it is in the full moon female, it is identified with the bull when it is in the form of a crescent. So there you have a connection to the Egyptian bull god and this golden calf. And in Babylon, they worshipped the cow that had the, the horns, which made the crescent shape. And in Egypt, they put a disc, the sun disc, in there. And in Babylon, the bull with the horns, it had um, a cow that they worshipped that had a crescent moon in the forehead like a mark in the forehead, standing for the moon god Sin. So, now I hope you're understanding where I'm going with this. Deities associated with the seven planets named Sin, Shamash, Ishtar, or Atargetus, Mara, Samyaya, or Ers, Gurgis, Bel, and Nabu or Nabig and their families Ningel, consort of Sin, Nusku and consort of the fire god, Sadar Nuna dominated the Haran pantheon from the Assyrian and Babylonian periods to the Islamic period. And now you know why I said that I believe that the false prophet has been here for a very long time. Because Muhammad took this crescent moon god worship and deceived all the people into worshiping the moon god Sin. And this is connected to Satan. So the moon god Sin is constantly at the top of the pantheon of gods. So I'm saying that the prophets of Israel of the Bible were the true prophets and there's a false prophet who claimed to be a prophet but he led all of these millions astray and has been doing so for centuries causing them to worship this false god the man of sin the moon god sin is constantly at the top of the pantheon of gods the name of the moon god sin is included in the treaties and agreements made between the kingdoms in Haran since the Assyrian and Babylonian periods it is even written that some treaties were made in the famous sin temple in Haran so they had a temple to this god and when God says sin not <laughs> he's telling you not to worship the moon god sin and the name of the temple built in the name of the god sin in Haran is Ihulhul 
the first formation about the sin cult, which is known to have a very old history, was revealed in a letter obtained from Mari, which was dated to about 1776 BC. Accordingly, it's understood that a decision was made to make peace in the Sin Temple in Haran. Thus, it is understood that Sin in Haran had an important position in the first half of the second millennium BC and that his name was heard more thanks to the presence of Sin. The two reliefs on the northern end of the hill south of the mount at the entrance of Sogmatar are quite striking. This hill is mentioned as a sacred hill in an inscription. The relief on the right is of a man depicted from the front and is in a frame with an arch, two quadrangular columns and two steps, rays radiate above his head. To the right of the relief is an inscription in Syriac. In the inscription, it says, quote, God commanded this image to manna on the 13th day of Adar, which was March 476, which is A.D. 165, is written. The other relief is a bust in a rock cut niche. To the right of this relief, behind the shoulders of the bust, a crescent with its ends upward draws attention. There is an inscription on both sides of the bust. In the first of these inscriptions, Silas' son, Sila, made this image for the god Sin, in memory of the life of Adonah's son, Tadot, and his brothers. In the second inscription, it says, I am God, I see him, I see him, and I am looking, I am God's sin. On the left side of this bust, in the inscription, the title of God is mentioned. The inscription says, May the son of Kuza, Zakai, and his children be remembered before God. It is clearly understood that this bust is the God's sin. It was a man due to the name sin in the inscription in the crescent motif. In addition, human reliefs and inscriptions can be seen on the south-north-west walls of the cave, which was identified by Pognon, the French ambassador to Aleppo, in the early 1900s and is called the Pognon Cave today. The presence of the crescent, which is the symbol of sin, on the top of the head of one of these reliefs reveals the presence of sin in the Sogmatar sanctuary. In Sogmatar, the name Maralahi is mentioned in two inscriptions. Maralahi, the king of the gods, in one inscription. Maralahi is the name of the moon god Sin in Old Akkadian and Aramaic known. So Nana Suen is another name for the uh, moon god Sin. Also known under various other names was the moon god of the Mesopotamians, and he was one of the few gods that ruled over multiple ancient civilizations, such as the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Babylonians. Despite the rise of the moon cult in Ur during the third dynasty, which was founded by Naram Sin, Nana was still popular throughout the history of Mesopotamia. He is the Mesopotamian god of the moon and wisdom, and he is one of the oldest gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon and is first mentioned at the very dawn of writing in the region circa 3500 BCE. Nana Suen was represented as an old man with a flowing beard. So the man of sin is this god, a wise and unfathomable god wearing a headdress of four horns surmounted by a crescent moon. I think about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I said a long time ago, one time I was looking up about Islam, and did you know that the four horsemen of the apocalypse, this was the order of the Islamic invasions. It was the white flag, the red flag, the black flag, and the green flag. So those were all from the man of sin conquering. Nanasuin was also depicted as a recumbent moon, which is associated with the lion, dragon, and the bull. 
He was also depicted as a man with a long beard who was riding on the back of a winged bull or a crescent moon. In many inscriptions, he is also referred to as the number 30, signifying the lunar calendar and the crescent moon as it was regarded as his barge in which he sailed along the night sky. Nana Sin or Suen was the god of the moon in the Mesopotamian regions of Sumer, Akkad, Assyria, Babylonia, and Aram. He was also associated with cattle, perhaps due to the perceived similarity between bull horns and the crescent moon. He was always described as a major deity, though only a few sources, mostly these from the reign of Nabonidus, consider him to be the head of the Mesopotamian pantheon. Two chief seats of his worship were Ur in the south of Mesopotamia and Haran in the north though he was also worshipped in numerous other cities, especially in the proximity of Ur and in the Dayala area. In Ur, he was connected to royal power and many Mesopotamian kings visited his temple in this city. According to Mesopotamian mythology, his parents were Enlil and Ninlil, while his wife was Ningal, worshipped with him in his major cult centers. Their children included major deities Inanna, or Ishtar, and Utu, Shamash. Now, when the Jews have the Hanukkah, they call that a Shamash candle. Anytime you hear any of these names, it goes back to the crescent moon god. Let me give you another description. Nana is represented as a recumbent moon and associated with the bull and lion dragon. He is further depicted as a seated man with a long beard of lapis lazuli, a crescent moon above him, or riding on the back of a winged bull. In many inscriptions, he is represented simply by the number 30, referring to the number of days in the lunar month, and a crescent moon was regarded as his barge in which he sailed through the night sky. Now, this is another article basically saying the same thing here. He was an immensely popular god, one of the original Sumerian pantheon. His cult center was at Ur, and his most famous high priestess was... Inhed Duena, although he has also had an important temple at Haran in modern day Syria, where his son was Nusku, god of fire and light. Nana Ningal and Nusku were worshipped as a triad through this veneration, mainly focused on the father and son. So it's kind of like a false trinity. Okay, so the moon god Sin is depicted as a bull and a lion dragon. In Chinese culture, the lion symbolizes strength, stability, and superiority, while the dragon represents power, boldness, and excellence. So now let's go to King Charles III. And that flag that Tim Cohen showed a long time ago, the flag of Wales, and it says, does Wales have a dragon or lion? The traditional national animal is the red dragon, a symbol that resplendently adorns the Welsh flag, which he showed in his book, The Antichrist in a Cup of Tea. What is the lion on the Welsh flag? So they have a lion, a dragon. So they have a lion and they have a dragon. The lion on red and gold was carried into battle during Owain Glynweir's rebellion against the English, although the design has since become synonymous with the legendary Welsh warrior. Its origins are unclear. I think I just showed you. So I'm going to show you one. I don't think Tim showed this one. History of the Welsh dragon and I want to show you this because this one has the um, dragon and at the top and in the badge is the English lion. 
the lion is on top of the crown at the top. And it looks like there's, it looks like a dog on the right hand side. So let me show you the lion dragon is a depiction of the man of sin. Are you grasping what I'm saying? This is a verification of where the lion dragon originated from the crescent moon god Sin. And the man of Sin was the moon god depicted. He was depicted as a man with a beard. And let me show you this picture of the history of the Welsh dragon. And I don't think Tim showed this one, but he did show the uh, regular Welsh flag. But look at this. I want you to notice the lion at the top of the crown. And then in the badge, you've got, it looks like the fleur de -lis opposite each other. And you've got the lions opposite each other. A dog on the right and a dragon on the left. Take a look at this. This is the flag of Wales that Tim Cohen showed in the Antichrist in a cup of tea. Excellent, excellent, thorough book of research. Uh, came out in 1998, and he's done a couple of editions now. I read the first edition with Mom back when we got it, when it was just new off the shelves. But this, it's got like the feet of a bird. It's got bat wings, and it's a dragon. So I particularly wanted to show you the other one that had the dog in it on the right and had the lion up above and the lions in the badge of England. Uh, that was their, uh, I think I said it was their armoral um, bindings have that lion on it. So there you have the lion dragon associated with the man of sin. The man of sin is the crescent moon god Sin. This was major worship in Babylon. And when you have someone who is accepting this and all faiths and going to change from the gospel alone as the one true God, and you're going to bring in these other religions, like the Indian Sikhs. He sat in a Sikh temple, King Charles III. He went to the Islamic mosques. He dressed as an Arab in the Arab garb with the sword over his shoulder. And he is represented by the lion dragon. And, of course, in Tim's book, he talked about Charles's investiture and he was facing the dragon on the chair, I guess, Tim told me. Um, I thought I saw the picture in the book. I saw on the back of the chair there was one of the dragons. So that was at his investiture as the Prince of Wales. We know the Antichrist is a prince, but he becomes a king. It's also important to note that Nana was the son of Marduk, who created him and placed him in the sky. You may also want to know that Nana Sin is referred to at a number of points throughout the Epic of Gilgamesh, where he is mentioned as the father of Shamash and Ishtar. So let's get this straight. Nana Sin, the man of Sin, the crescent moon god Sin, Represented by the bull, lion dash dragon, symbol is the crescent moon. Calving became a metaphor for human delivery. The incantation, a cow of sin, which goes back to the Ur, the third period, was recited for the woman in travail. It relates that moon god sin lusted for a cow, mounted her, and impregnated her. 
When the cow was due to give birth, labor pangs gripped her and became too exhausted and unable to deliver the calf until the moon god sent two spirits to assist her and she finally gave birth. The supplication is that, like the cow, the woman in labor should give birth easily. Now, I want to show you an old Babylonian cylinder seal with the storm god, which he's known as the storm god, on a lion dragon holding a forked lightning and a cow sucking calf. I just wanted you to see the lion dragon in this picture, this relief. So now we have brought it all together that the man of sin is from ancient Babylon and earlier than that it's from Haran where Abram was taken out of the city and went to the land that became that had been Eden God brought him back to show him he's the one true God and Tim Cohen showed in his book the heraldry of Prince of Wales coat of arms. It has the lion on the left, the unicorn on the right with the little horn, and it has the lions opposite each other and the harp and the lion at the top of the armor helmet and the crown. Now that's the one that Tim Cohen went into a lot of detail in his book about the Antichrist in a cup of tea. But this is another one, Wales National Symbol of the Red Dragon. This is a different one. This one has the lion on the left, the lions opposite each other in both directions. It's got the lion on top of the armored helmet and the crown, the lion at the top, and the dragon is to the right. This is a different one. And I want to show you the England Royal Coat of Arms of the United Kingdom Welsh Dragon House of Tudor. So the major astonishing detail about this video is that I have now connected the lion dragon and the bull, the golden calf, to the man of sin, which is the crescent moon god sin. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3 Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. There's a great apostasy coming because if you go from being defender of the faith, the only faith, the gospel of the one true God of Israel, the Lord and Savior Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel, and you embrace these other faiths including the crescent moon god sin you have become the man of sin this was written september 14 2022 king charles the third the uk's most pro-islam monarch king charles expressed profound respect for islam in islamic civilization on multiple occasions before his recent accession to the throne a conspiracy theory has been circulating on the internet in recent days is king charles the third the uk's new monarch a muslim Pictures of the then 73-year-old, who's now 74, who assumed the throne after Queen Elizabeth II's death in a series of Islamic garments have been shared widely online along with 
comments of the then Prince of Wales praising the virtues of Islam. Back in 1996, the Grand Mufti of Cyprus shockingly claimed that the new king was secretly a Muslim. Given the modern British monarchy's commitment to the Church of England, the church in which my own faith is so deeply rooted, as Charles recently said, this theory could be dismissed almost instantly. In 1993, the new king was made a patron of the renowned Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. Charles devoted his inaugural address to challenge notions that Islamic and Christian societies stood at odds with each other, a binary which he viewed as misguided and fueled by the media. Instead, he stressed that these two worlds must live and work together. For that which binds our two worlds is so much more powerful than that which divides us, he said. The then Prince of Wales spoke about shared values such as justice, respect for knowledge, compassion towards the poor, and the importance of family life. Okay, so you have the crescent moon god Sin that the Muslims are worshipping through a false prophet, a self-appointed prophet, and he's been deceiving people for centuries. And now Charles wants to incorporate not only that religion, but all these other faiths into the coronation ceremony. It may not be a part of the oath, which is the covenant with God, but we are going to have to wait and see what happens. Hopefully we won't be here when this all goes down. With him befriending the Israeli rabbis, let me just tell you that the members of the Sanhedrin, those rabbis, met with the Turk Adnan Oktar. He told the rabbis of the Sanhedrin that they would build the third temple and he would help them and it would be a mosque. So it's going to incorporate not just Judaism, but other faiths of different gods. And the man of sin, God, is the crescent moon god and he's embraced the crescent moon god the man of sin is now revealed and when people uh, a king changes the oath it is a great apostasy the lawlessness that's already at work is being revealed. It was already there in Jesus' day. It was there back in Babylon. It was there at Mount Sinai. It was there in Egypt. It goes way back. And now the man of sin is connected to the lion dragon. Thus proving the man of sin was present at the Prince of Wales investiture. So I'm bringing all of this together with the lion and the dragon symbols connecting it to the man of sin and the crescent moon god sin. So now you know and this should just blow you away. In 2006 at a Unity in Faith speech at Egypt's Al Azhar University, the world's second oldest university, the new monarch told the audience, we need to remember that we in the West are in debt to the scholars of Islam, for it was thanks to them that during the Dark Ages in Europe, the treasures of classical learning were kept alive. This is the theme Charles has turned to repeatedly in his speeches, the idea that history is not a linear trajectory of Christian enlightenment, but must be seen as an amalgamation of cultures and societies that interacted over time and were enriched by each other. As the Prince of Wales, Charles made several speeches about Islamic finance, showcasing his detailed knowledge of the benefits it could bring to global markets. 
In 2013, a speech he gave at the World Islamic Economic Forum in London, he said, Where then might the solutions lie? It's clear from the Quran and indeed from the Bible too, that humanity has a sacred responsibility for the stewardship of the earth. The time has surely come for our financial institutions to recognize that the earth is not a limitless resource that can be plundered at will and to integrate the principle of stewardship into our financial structures. Through the lion and the dragon and his investiture, all of the things that Tim showed in his book, but now bringing you what the crescent moon god's sin was and is, and how it's related to the lion dragon. Combine this with the fact that the king's mark is not only his royal cipher, but the leopard mentioned in Revelation 13. He's all four of those beasts. He's the leopard, he's the bear, he's the lion, and the dragon. The lion and the dragon were the last two. And those connect to the man of sin. This is more proof that what I've been saying, what Tim Cohen said in his book, connects to the man of sin, the son of perdition. And now you know, and I'll just leave you with the hairs of your head standing up. <laughs> Unbelievable stuff. Like, subscribe, and share. And please support my work and my channel. It's greatly needed and appreciated. I love you guys. I thank every single person who saved my life, literally at times. And I can't thank you enough for being there for me through my hard times. Love and blessings to everyone. I pray that the Lord, through His power, through His Holy Spirit, opens your eyes, opens your ears, and your mind to see the truth. There's only one way back to the Garden of Eden-like state, and that is through the Messiah who died for your sins, was uh, dead, buried, and resurrected on the third day. Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who came to save the world from its sins. Accept him in your heart today. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Good night.